Hello there. This is Pastor Jack Snow from First Baptist Church in Fort Hope. Welcome again to our YouTube channel as we endeavor to um, share God's word with uh, whoever's watching, whether you're from First Baptist Church in Fort Hope or, or elsewhere in this, uh, this time of dealing with the virus pandemic. And um, if you're watching this on Sunday, April the 5th, it's Palm Sunday. And so we want to focus on the Palm Sunday passages this morning and to see what we can learn from three different groups of people that are part of the Palm Sunday story. Now, the Palm Sunday story is found in three different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called the Synoptic Gospels because a lot of the stories in these three Gospels are similar. But it's very interesting to see how each one is somewhat different. Some people get tripped up with that, thinking, well, the Bible is different, and the stories aren't the same, and it's contradictory, but it's three different angles of the same story, and each one emphasizes something different. It's like if three different people saw a car accident out on the corner over here in John and Augustus, Augustus Street, just outside the church. Somebody was standing in front of the church, and they would see it one perspective of the accident, and someone else would be standing over on the other corner in front of the dentist's office. And they would see the same accident from the perspective. And then someone else would watch it from the third floor window of the Carlisle Hotel across the street. And they would look down and they would see things maybe that the other two didn't see. None of them are lying. <laughs> it's the same accident, just different angles of the same story. And that's what we see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then we see that a little bit in the Palm Sunday story. We want to, I'm going to read to you the uh, story out of Luke and we'll focus on that. But we want to share a little bit the story of uh, Matthew and Mark as well. It's Luke chapter 19, verses 29 to 44, if you want to follow along on your phone or on your Bible, printed page, whatever you've got. Luke chapter 19, verses 29 to 44. It says, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Beth. Phage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Let me quickly find the Matthew passage. And I want to read a couple of verses from that. That adds a little bit of an extra piece to the story. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 10, it said, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, so after he wept for the city outside the walls, and now Matthew's talking about what happened next. And Jesus entered Jerusalem. The whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So we want to look at three different groups of people, and each one had a different idea and responded differently to who Jesus was. First, we want to look at the people who were on the road to Jerusalem, all the crowds heading to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. They were from the countryside. They were from the small towns and villages around Jerusalem. And they had firsthand experience 
of Jesus. They had witnessed his miracles. They had heard his teaching. And they recognized him for who he was. These were the villagers, the common people, the ordinary people. And as Jesus approached Jerusalem riding this donkey, they spontaneously broke out in worship because they recognized who Jesus was. They believed that he was the Messiah, the one come to deliver them. Second group of people were the Pharisees or the religious leaders. And not only did they not believe Jesus was the Messiah, but they thought that by him claiming to be that he was being sacrilegious and he was just he needed to be destroyed, he needed to be uh, taken care of. So the Pharisees actively worked to discredit Jesus, actively worked to destroy him. And so they watched everything he did, and they listened to everything he said, and they tried to find things that he would say or do that would trip him up, and they would ask him what they thought were trick questions, they wanted to embarrass him and discredit him in front of his followers. And so they were watching this, this parade. And um, I'm going to post on the Facebook page. I don't know if I can do it here on YouTube, but there's this video that Michael W. Smith did 30 years ago to a song called Secret Ambition. And when I was in youth ministry, I would play this video every Easter for my youth group. Even though as years went on, the music got a bit dated, but the message was so powerful. I used to call this video a life of Jesus in six minutes and 20 seconds, because that's kind of what it was. And uh, I remember when I pop the video in and, and show it to you for the first time, they would be okay with Jeff showing us now. And they'd be kind of like, oh, okay, this is kind of funny. Or they'd be kind of, some were watching and some would be kind of, you know, giggling with each other or whatever. But by about four minutes into it, there wasn't, there was like, you hear a pin drop, there was silence because it began to show the story of Jesus and his crucifixion and what he went through. But in the, in the snippet of the video that shows Palm Sunday, you pan the crowd and you see all the palms being waved. And then through the palms, at the back, you see these three religious leaders, these three Pharisees, just looking at the whole demonstration with this look of, of disapproval, these frowns on their faces, you know, just, wanting to do something about this. And at one point, Scripture tells us that, that some of the Pharisees did step out and say to Jesus, rebuke those people, rebuke those, these followers that are praising you. You see, this was another trick question, because if Jesus did rebuke them, then he would be tactically saying to them, I'm not worthy of your praise. I you could be hinting at the fact that he's not really the Messiah. Um, be agreeing with the Pharisees that they shouldn't praise him. But Jesus said to them, he always, he always had an answer for the Pharisees. And he said to them, um, if these folks stay quiet, um, the very rocks will cry out praises to God. And so the religious leaders were like, boiled again. One more reason why we have to get rid of this guy. And so they began the plot for the following week that finally culminated in what they thought was getting rid of them. The religious leaders were confronted with the truth about Jesus being the Messiah. They, a lot of them saw the miracles, a lot of them heard the teaching, but they would not believe. And more than that, they actively worked against Jesus, the Messiah. The third group of people were the people inside the city of Jerusalem. This was the holy city. This was the place where the Messiah would come one day in triumph. All the prophets talked about it. This was a city where you'd think the people living there would know the prophecies and would come to expect the Messiah. And yet they had no clue. It had been hundreds of years. And now they were under Roman occupation and they had kind of lost hope, I guess, and just had no clue about the Messiah, or just had no clue about that Jesus, the Messiah, had come. They had no first-hand knowledge of Jesus' miracles and his acts. I kind of think there may have been an urban-rural thing going on here where, you know, these sophisticated city people in Jerusalem were dismissing the stories about this miracle worker being told by these country hicks. But before Jesus entered the city, he wept because 
they didn't even recognize the time of God's coming to them, didn't recognize that the Messiah was here. Um, why? why? Why do you think um, they didn't recognize the Messiah for who he was? Well, I think first they had the wrong expectations. They've been under Roman rule for so long and under occupation and had gone through so many tough times that I think there was a militaristic side that had kind of been tacked on to the story of the Messiah. And they saw the Messiah coming as a military ruler, as a great deliverer, as some warrior on a white horse instead of a grown man sitting on a tiny donkey. So it didn't meet their expectations. Secondly, I think there was, there was ignorance. And, you know, I don't, it's a harsh word sometimes, but um, they just didn't know or they didn't make themselves aware of what was happening. We read in Matthew's version, the, the people said, who is this? They had, they had no clue about why Jesus was causing such commotion, why he was causing such praise to happen. I think perhaps they were being in the city, they were just caught up in their own stuff. They were caught up in their own business, caught up in their own world. And when the time came, they just didn't recognize him. And I think there was, like, he didn't meet their expectations, there was ignorance, and I think there was apathy. Um, Jesus as Messiah coming just wasn't on their radar. He just didn't connect with their lives. In Mark's version, Mark, the Gospel of Mark is always like, it's like the Reader's Digest version of the Gospel. It's kind of like the dragnet, if you're old enough to remember dragnet, the dragnet version of the Gospel is it's just the facts, man. Just the facts. Doesn't tell a whole lot about the story. Just kind of gives very quick details about what went on. And um, so in Mark, we hear what happened after Jesus went to Jerusalem. He says that Jesus went into the temple, he looked around at everything, and because it was getting late, he left. And that's it. This is the moment that the Jews had been waiting for for years, and it was kind of like. I don't imagine the temple was empty. It was probably bustling with people. And I can imagine Jesus the Messiah walking into the temple, and this is the moment that he's been waiting for hundreds of years. I can picture him standing there like somebody in the middle of Grand Central Station, which are people just walking past them and going off and doing their own thing. And he could be shouting, he could be shouting, I'm here, this is it. But nothing. People just didn't notice. Jesus the Messiah had come to his people and he was met with a shrug. It's not a question of whether they believed or didn't believe in the Messiah. They, they just didn't care. I want to focus on this third group, the people in Jerusalem. I, I think they reflect many people in our society today. They, when they're confronted with Jesus, they have a problem because of expectations. They think, what will I get out of it? They have a very utilitarian view of faith and spiritual things. It's like, if, it, if this works, if this works for me, then it's a good thing. Or they have more of a consumer mentality when it comes to faith than to Jesus. You know, if Jesus gives me what I want and meets my expectations, then it's a good thing. Uh, if he doesn't, and if it doesn't work in the way I, I want it to work, well, then I'm going to move on to something else. There's expectations, there, there's ignorance. Um, and again, I don't mean that in a harsh way, but ignorance in the sense of just not knowing. I've worked with young people in various ways in the church for 23 years. And I have noticed in the last six or seven years a growing biblical illiteracy. I mean, it was always pretty bad in the general population, but getting worse to the point where our young people have no clue. They've never set, into a, set foot in a church, even for a funeral or a wedding. I coach um, the Reach, Reach for the Top team at my local high school. I've been doing it for about eight or nine years. And uh, it's a trivia game where we compete against other schools. And, and we should be in the finals right now, but <laughs> everything got canceled. I'm so upset. Um, but we get the questions from the main office of REACH in Toronto, and, and they're all different categories and questions, different topics. And um, so often, to my, much to my pleasant surprise, they have questions on religion, all kinds of religions, but also questions on the Bible and Christianity. 
And so I'll be asking the questions for a, for a game or whatever, and I'll say, well, the next category is the Bible. And the next category is religion or Christianity. So many of the kids just kind of sit back and kind of go, well, I'll just wait for the next category because I know that I won't have a food. And that's just the way our younger generation is in, in so many ways. And there are many in society who are just, like the people in Jerusalem, too busy, uh, too caught up in their own things to think about spiritual things, to think about the deeper things in life. They're too caught up, maybe in legit concerns, like looking after their family, which is a good thing, but it, it can supersede the search for the spiritual, it can supersede considering just who Jesus is. Because the best thing we can do for our family is point them to Jesus, really. And they, because Jesus just isn't on the, don't know, they don't know much about him, they don't recognize him. They don't recognize when God, by his spirit, is at work in this world and in their lives. Expectations, ignorance, and apathy. For a lot of people, church just is not on the radar, not part of their lives. It's not an important thing. And like the people in Jerusalem, they will be confronted or introduced to Jesus, and they will meet him with a shrug and just move on. So how does this apply to our present situation, what we're going through with COVID-19 and, and the way the world has changed? Well, C.S. Lewis says that God whispers in our joys and screams in our pain. Something like that. I didn't look up the exact quote, but it was a long. He talked talk about how pain is God's megaphone. A lot of times, pain and difficult times are used by God to get our attention. If you're old enough to remember 9-11, Remember that in the months after 9-11, in the States, but also in Canada, that there was a surge, an, up, an uptick, an increase in church attendance because people's lives got shaken and they were looking for something more, a deeper foundation. It's during those challenging times that people will be more willing to look into the spiritual, more willing to hear about what God may have for their lives, more willing to listen to us if we have the opportunity to share. Listen to who Jesus really is and not put their expectations on him. So many, you hear that expression so much where people say, well, the God I know would never do this, the God I know wouldn't do that. But when you compare that to the God of Scripture, as he's revealed himself, you realize that sometimes the God that we make in our own image is in real, isn't the real God. And so sometimes people will be more willing to listen to, who Jesus, to us talk about who Jesus really is, more willing to, to learn and not be spiritually or biblically illiterate, more willing to, to actually care and give it some thought rather than just respond with a shrug. It's our opportunity to be a light in the weeks to come. It's our opportunity to speak words of life to people, to be God's hands and feet, to speak those words with gentleness and respect. But then there's the flip side where there are going to be people who will ask the question, why does God allow this? Why are we going to do this? And I think it's in conversations like that, our words are going to fall on deaf ears. And so what I think God calls us to do in contexts like that is to reach out in love and in comfort, to be a, an example of peace, the peace and calm that God can give into our lives, uh, just the confidence that God is still in control. We can be an example of what God is doing in our lives, and that, in these kind of contexts, can speak louder than words. And finally, we don't want to just look at the people, other people, we want to look at ourselves, too. Jesus is in our midst. It's like that scene in Mark where he's standing in the middle of the temple and everyone is going around him and not even recognizing him. And so our challenge is do we recognize Jesus in our own lives and work the work that he wants to do and what he's already doing? Because we have this opportunity right now, like for many of us, there are a lot less distractions. In life. There's a lot less going on. Life is different. And we have that opportunity to recognize that Jesus is here by his spirit in our midst, and that he is working in our lives. 
we want to use this time to recognize his work in our lives, perhaps in ways that we never noticed, never recognized before. We want to use this time to, to be with him and to, to learn from him new things and new perspectives that maybe we had never given thought to before. We want to use this time to understand his expectations of us rather than the other way around. The Messiah is here. Palm Sunday reminds us that Jesus is here in our midst and that we are never, ever alone. Let's praise him for that. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Can I pray for you? Lord, thank you for each person who has heard this. Thank you, Lord, for your word and what it teaches us and how it can relate and apply to our lives today. And I pray, Lord, that we would always respond to you like the first group of people, not like the second or the third. And we would respond to you with praise, worship, lifting you high for you are worthy and you deserve it. I pray, Lord, for our friends and family and those around us, that as Jesus is in our midst, amidst the difficult time in life, the time when life is very different and, and for some very scary, I pray, Lord, that our friends and family would know your touch, would know your love, would know that you are there for them, and you would help us to be a part of that. Help us to share the right words in season with gentleness and respect. Help us to share the truth with those that we care about. Help us to be living examples of your love and your comfort and your peace and your serenity. And in times when we are shaken, in times when we are um, afraid and unsure of what's going on, I pray, Lord, that you would be there in our midst that you would give us the peace and the calm and the serenity, the strength that we need to make it through the coming days and weeks. We thank you, Lord, for the story of Palm Sunday. We thank you, Lord, for coming to be a very real presence in our lives. We praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this week is Easter, is the Holy Week coming up, and um, normally in Port Hope on Good Friday, three churches get together and do a service together. No, four actually, so it's four now. And uh, we're obviously not doing that this week, but we will have something put onto YouTube on for Friday, for Good Friday at Good Friday Focus, and also for Easter Sunday. So um, between myself and Ruth, we'll be putting up some music and some devotionals. And I think we're going to continue posting the series on the Apostles' Creed from a couple of years ago that you could follow along with that, almost like a Christianity 101 kind of teaching. And so, um, yeah, I hope you uh, will be blessed and, and just um, enjoy um, these messages and presentations, which aren't the same as being together. Uh, we miss being together, but we praise the Lord for this kind of technology that gives us these opportunities. So have yourself a good rest of this week and coming days, and we'll chat again later. Bye.